Coming up on DTNS, Tim Stevens shares the mobility trends to come at CES, including scooters, rolling pods, and flying cars, plus the brewing war over 8K resolution, and finally, a showerhead you can talk to. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 3rd, 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And as I mentioned, Tim Stevens, editor-in-chief for CNET's Roadshow, back on the show. Welcome back, Tim. Thanks for having me, Tom. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming back. Uh, it's sort of an annual tradition, as I mentioned on Good Day Internet, uh, to have Tim on right at the beginning of the year. He was the very first guest of Daily Tech News Show all those years ago. So I, I'm always very thankful for that, Tim. I'm very thankful for that, too. Uh, in fact, if you want to hear us talking about that and sleep number beds and CES diseases, uh, you got to get Good Day Internet <laughs> by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Wireless charging accessory maker Zen's is now accepting pre-orders for its Liberty wireless charger with 16 charging coils and an overlapping array that means you don't need to place the device down in a very specific way in order to charge it. You just pop it on there and it pretty much works. Up to two Qi compatible devices can be charged with 15 watts of power at once. A fabric model retails for 140 euros, it's about 155 US dollars, and a glass edition, which lets you see all of the coils inside kind of nice, is 180 euros. An add-on to also charge an Apple Watch sells for 40 euros. Samsung announced it sold 6.7 million 5G phones in 2019 between the Galaxy S10 5G and the Galaxy Note 10 Plus 5G. That's a little bit better than the expected 4 million, so they, they did about 2.7 million more than they thought they would. Samsung now says its devices count for 53.9% of the total 5G marketplace, which is and a very small marketplace still, but... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that changes a year from now. Lenovo announced updates to its X1 laptop lineup with Intel's 10th gen Ice Lake processors, up to 16 gigs of RAM and up to two terabytes of internal storage. Lenovo also added new function keys for voice over IP calls, and both the X1 Carbon and X1 Yoga can be customized with a new Privacy Guard 1080p display with 500 nits, so quite a bit brighter than previous models. The X1 Carbon starts at $1,499, and the X1 Yoga starts at $1,599. Uh, for you conference room fans at CES, Lenovo will show off the ThinkSmart View smart display that runs Microsoft Teams, essentially an audio video conferencing device that's more affordable than similar enterprise solutions that generally run $1,800 or more. The View starts at $349, or if you want an included pair of Bluetooth headphones for your open office, $449. It launches later this month. Apple announced that former HBO CEO Richard Plepler's production company, Eden Productions, has a five-year deal to develop original content exclusively for Apple TV+. Plepler left HBO in February of 2019 following AT&T's acquisition of Time Warner. All right, let's talk a little more about a very unsettling thing that happened with the Xiaomi cameras. Yeah, everybody loves a story like this. Android police noticed that a user on Reddit called DOV said that their Xiaomi Mejia 1080p smart IP security camera was showing still images that appeared to be from other people's homes. The images appeared when they tried to stream from their camera to a Google Nest hub. DOV told The Verge they saw somebody's porch, they saw a man sleeping in a chair, they saw a sleeping baby in a crib, so this is personal stuff here. Google issued a statement saying, quote, we're aware of the issue and are in contact with Xiaomi to work on effects. In the meantime, we're disabling Xiaomi integrations on our devices. Xiaomi has since told The Verge the issue had to do with a cache update meant to improve streaming quality. Xiaomi also said it's fixed the bug, will, will, will not resume Nest integration until the root cause has been completely solved. Yeah, so this is fairly unsettling, uh, as I said, but uh, it didn't happen with Xiaomi's own app, so you can still use that. It was only with the Nest integration, which Xiaomi is one of the few companies to get certified for that Nest integration uh, these days uh, in order to protect security. I, I, this wasn't a breach. It wasn't an attack. Uh, it was just a, a weird bug, and it was fairly rare. Uh, it, it wasn't like hundreds of thousands of people were seeing these images, but it, it was out there, and it was a little weird. 
It's also a bit creepy. They showed some of the pictures and they were all kind of distorted and kind of like a Japanese horror film. They're all kind of digitized. <laughs> and as if it wasn't bad enough that your personal information, your pictures in your home are being exposed, they're being exposed in a very creepy way. It was definitely top to bottom, not a good story. I, Tim, uh, Tim, where do you stand on the... Dimension. Tim, where do you stand on the kind of security camera home, the, you know, the, the possibility that this type of thing might happen, rare as it is, still possible? Yeah, I mean, usually with these sorts of cameras, you have to worry about firmware vulnerabilities and faults and, you know, default passwords being left on and things like that. And this is like a whole new level of thing to worry about where you could have everything perfectly set correctly, all the security updates, the latest firmware on your device, and still have your stuff be exposed uh, due to a third-party integration. Um, so I think that shows some of the, the vulnerabilities of a lot of our smart home devices, even if you keep them integrated or, or updated themselves. If you add in a third party integration at that point, you're just adding more potential vulnerabilities. And as you saw in this case, even though it wasn't an explicit attack, like you said, Tom, it was still a possibility for something to go wrong. And it did go wrong. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that's completely out of anybody's hands. No consumer could have really prevented this. And that that is definitely troubling. And and bugs happen. So whenever you are putting your data, images or otherwise, in, in a cloud provider's hands, uh, the, this is possible. Uh, this is why people are clamoring for better security precautions to make this very rare. And and it, it is so far very rare. But as these items proliferate, and we're going to see a ton of them at CES, uh, the need for security precautions to be built in and to be tightened up uh, is going to be necessary so that you prevent bugs from causing this sort of thing. You make it really hard for this sort of thing to happen. TechCrunch reports on a tip from Israel's market research startup Watchful.ai that code in ByteDance's TikTok and Douyin or Android apps refer to a feature called face swap. Remember, Douyin is essentially TikTok in China. The code found in both would ask a user to take a multi-angle scan of their face, then choose from a selection of watermarked videos that they would like to put their face into to share. So it's a fun little filter game. It's making sure it's you. It doesn't let you share anybody else. That's why it's got to scan your face and make you move your face. It can only put it in pre-selected videos that TikTok or Duyen said they had the rights to. The technology fits the description of a deep fake, but would be limited. So TechCrunch suggests this might raise awareness of what deep fake technology could do. Unpublished updates to the terms of service found by Watchful state that your facial pattern will only be used to generate face change videos. Chinese terms of service for the Douyin app further stated that matches are deleted immediately and your facial features are not stored. Now, remember, neither of these are launched. These are things in the code. So TechCrunch reached out to TikTok and TikTok said, this is definitely not a function in TikTok, nor do we have any intention of introducing it. So pouring cold water <laughs> on that, took the code out of the app, said, maybe it's going to be in Duyan. We don't know. We don't talk to them. Uh, and uh, Duyan just kind of said like, hey, uh, we, we have nothing to say about this right now. You know, the face pop thing as... As you know, talking about creepy, I mean, some of the stuff, as we've mentioned on the show previously um, and recently, is creepy enough to confuse. But this is not uh, the sort of, I don't know, uh, upcoming feature that I uh, that I would have, it, it wouldn't have really freaked me out at all. It seems like the next logical step. I mean, look at all the stuff that Snapchat is doing. It's the same idea, isn't it? I think it it actually could be pretty funny. You know, a lot of people in TikTok are, of course, recreating music videos. And in this case, you could actually put your face on, you know, Janet Jackson or someone like that and be in the actual music video. So I think that's probably sort of what they're thinking about. I think that could be actually kind of fun. So I'm, yeah, I'm with you, sir. I think this could be could be a fun addition to the app if indeed it comes together. And it also could raise awareness for what this sort of technology can do. Uh, and, you know, there are some troubling implications there, too. But I think this could be fun. And yet TikTok's reaction was like, oh, hell no. We want nothing to do with that, <laughs> and that idea. And that's, that's kind of what surprised me the most. Yeah. Is, yeah. You know, you'd think that the company would be like, hey, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. Our, you know, 5 billion users at this point are going to love it. It's going to, you know, you know, revolutionize. But they were like, nope, not doing this. We yeah. are not doing this. Uh, moving on to OnePlus, which is always good for concept phones at this year's CES, will be no exception because OnePlus is teasing the concept one. It has an invisible rear camera array with color shifting glass. An electrochromatic sheet of glass covers the rear cameras and can switch to opaque with an electrical signal, which then hides the cameras. That means you have a nice smooth back to the phone rather than the, non, the, the now common camera bump we've all gotten used to, but, you know, it 
would be nice if it was smoother. OnePlus worked with car company McLaren, which uses electric chromic glass in its cars as well. The array of the prototype features a 48 megapixel primary lens and a 16 megapixel ultra wide lens, the same as in the OnePlus 7T Pro McLaren edition. OnePlus is looking for feedback from users. I don't know, Tim. McLaren sounds like a sounds like a fancy phone. Yeah, I mean the McLaren integration is great. McLaren is always doing lots of cool high tech things in their cars. Uh, in in their cars, McLaren is using this actually for sunroof. So basically, you have uh, a big sheet of glass instead of a roof in your car, and at the touch of a button, it goes dark. Of uh, the sun's out. If you want to, you know, see the stars or see the sky, you hit a button and it goes clear. And I think in that application, it's very cool. But in the camera, I honestly don't see it being that much of a big step forward because you still got the same lens packaging you have before. You still have to have a separate pane of glass to cover the, the camera. So it doesn't really, I think, fundamentally change the design of the of the phone itself. It just kind of hides the, the lenses. And, and honestly, I don't really care if people can see that I have three or four 18 lenses on the back of my phone personally. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I, I don't sit here and think about the, the bump on my Pixel 4 or my iPhone 10, uh, either one. I, I'm, I'm not upset by them. I'm not sitting here wishing that someone would solve this problem. But maybe they, maybe you're out there. Uh, if you're mm -hmm. the person who's like, yes, this has always bothered me. I would love to have this. Uh, let, let us know. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. And at what price? Because OnePlus wants the feedback. They, they want to know, is this something people like? Uh, and the fact that they're teaming up with McLaren makes it sound like they're thinking it might be a luxury, high-end feature to me. Definitely. Yeah. LG announced eight 8K TVs. So there were eight televisions, all of them 8K, uh, all of them supporting either Amazon's voice services, Google Assistant, AirPlay 2, and HomeKit. I should, shouldn't have said or. All of them support all of those, as well as native support for HEVC, VP9, and AV1 codecs. So right there in the TV, you don't need an add-on box. Two of them are OLED models. Those are the 77 and 80-inch model, 88-inch models. There's also six nanocell LCDs that are between 65 and 75 inches, and all of them support 8K streaming at up to 60 frames per second through HDMI and 5.1 surround, 5 surround sound and 8K upscaling using LG's Alpha 9 Gen 3 AI processor. Now, that AI does some recognition of faces, too, to optimize the appearance during upscaling. So the fact that there's not any 8K uh, content out there, no big deal. You've got this upscaling to bide your time until there is 8K content. The other thing that's going on here is LG calls these real 8K, which is an early shot in the burgeoning 8K format war. Uh, everybody agrees that 8K is 7680 by 4320, no matter who is defining it. But how you measure those pixels is in dispute. LG is following the ICDM and CTA definitions, which don't just count the pixels, but use contrast modulation to determine if the pixels are clearly distinguishable from each other. Contrast modulation measures the ability of a screen to distinguish a pattern of alternating one pixel wide white and black lines. So you gotta have really good contrast to see that. And they say, if you can't do that at more than 50%, then it's not really 8K because everything gets smudged together too much. Samsung, on the other hand, uses the definition from the 8K Association, of which Samsung is a member and LG is not. The 8K Association definition does not require contrast modulation to be used, though the 8K Association agrees that contrast modulation may be a better way to measure pixels. The 8K Association has argued it's not necessarily a better way of measuring image quality. And so they have, they are working still on the final certification for 8K through the 8K Association that will say you're going to get a really good image quality out of 8K, not just the actual pixels. Uh, so it's, it's, it's probably not going to end up being a fight that matters to most people. But if you hear about real 8K versus not real 8K and, and war of words between Samsung, maybe Sony and LG, uh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's, who's uh, I don't know, I'm watching very little 4K content, I can't imagine anybody saying, <laughs> well, it's a real 8K TV, and me being like, whoa, hello. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I understand the distinction being made. I think that the human eye is probably going to miss a lot of this stuff, but oh, it yeah. is a distinction nonetheless. 
I just love that there's zero 8K content available, but we already have the format war beginning, and I think that's a wonderful thing. So, yeah. you know, 8K is coming because the format war is here, so good times I, ahead. I remember in 2010, the 4K TVs having this exact same conversation. Mm -hmm. There's no 4K content. What do you need it for? I remember in 1999, the 1080 TVs. <laughs> like, there's no content <laughs> for it. What do you need it for? So it eventually comes, and what it'll be good for, you know, nobody knows until it arrives. With 4K, it turned out HDR was the thing that made people go, mm -hmm. ooh, that looks really good. So I think about that when I think about the 8K Association's argument here is like, yeah, it really is about what it looks like, not how many pixels. Because a 4K image, like you said, Sarah, doesn't really show up that differently to our eyes, but it allows you to do things like HDR, which does make the picture look really good. Well, uh, CES right around the corner, you start getting some pretty creative technology solutions. And this one is no different. Kohler will show off a smart speaker with Amazon voice services that slots inside of a shower head. The Kohler movie shower head, Moxie shower head rather, is a circular ring. It sells for $70. You buy the smart speaker and then you can get that for $99 if you only want Bluetooth, or you can go for $159 if you want Amazon's voice control as well. You get six to seven hours of battery life from the Bluetooth version, up to five hours from the voice controlled only one. And then here's the thing, it is a shower and you have to recharge your shower head occasionally. Oh. Wanna, do you wanna do that? I don't know, maybe, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. Yes, it's all IPX67 waterproof, so you don't have to worry about that anyway. All the items will be available sometime this year. Kohler also announced it will show off its Vader Smart Mirror with Amazon Voice, an upgrade to the Numi Intelligent Toilet, also with Amazon Voice, and the Pure Warmth Heated Toilet Seat that doesn't have Amazon Voice, but does have its own app for controlling the heat. Uh, so I was on those chilly mornings. You just get on in there and, <laughs> you know, warm right up. No joke. The, all the toilet the toilet seats I sat on in Japan were heated. It was mm -hmm. pretty amazing. You know, all um, heating aside, a heated toilet seat is a very nice thing. I mean, I really wish I had one at home. Uh, and maybe I'll get the pure warmth now that it has an app. Uh, but to this shower head, I was all on board for this because I do keep an Amazon Echo in the bathroom and I listen to music on it or weather updates. And sometimes I want to tell it to skip or something from the shower and it can't really hear me from there. So it'd be great if it was in the shower with me until you got to the port about charging it. I don't want to have to remember to charge this thing and pull it in and out of the shower. So that's kind of a deal killer for me. Yeah, yeah. I was e exactly the same way. I was thinking exact, exactly the same thing. I think it's actually a good idea until you have to charge a thing. And I don't know why they couldn't just wait until they can develop like a micro turbine or something like that to slot right. in the shower head to charge it. Uh, I would think that that would provide enough, maybe. I don't know. But uh, I think without just that kind of technology, this thing is, is just the kind of thing that's meant to get people talking ahead of CES. And we'll see some more devices like that soon, too. It, it's the modern version of of the uh, what you used to see in the Sky Mall, the, the mm -hmm. shower radio, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just now it's voice controlled. Yeah, I, I'm I don't more know. Into I mean, the there, seat. I hate to say. <laughs> there's there there are probably some shower singers in the audience who are like, "This is great! Oh, I love it!" You know, it's it's you know it's it's that much easier. Like you said, Tom, instead of shouting over you know whatever your shower setup is to wherever your smart speaker is, it's it's right in there with you. But the charging thing makes it so clunky. I would never buy this. Yeah, I I have to say, um, I I think they they need to go back to the drawing board. Take Tim's idea of little water wheels in there that will uh, charge the, the battery from the flowing water that's going through the shower head. That's, that's, it's brilliant. It's right there, right there in front of you. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Of course, uh, Tim, as the editor in chief of Roadshow, you'll be at CES looking at cars and scooters and and other odd things that roll <laughs> around and help us move from place to place. Uh, what what is your take on CES as you head in? Well, CES is you know definitely an increasingly an automotive show, uh, especially as the Detroit Motor Show is now moving from January into the summer. That leaves kind of a lot of automakers want to show off something in January. This is the place they're going to do it. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, a lot's still under embargo, so I can't talk too many details. But I know we will see some very cool concept cars some of which are, are more likely to come into production than others. But certainly there's going to be some really cool stuff to see on the show floor. Um, and some more practical stuff, too. You know, we talked about LG having an 8K TV. They're also going to be showing off some interesting automotive displays that will fit in the dashboard of your car. Things will allow for a curved display that goes across the entire width of your dashboard, which is going to be kind of neat. And also uh, another form of transportation, they're going to be showing off uh, high-definition displays for high-end first-class cabins as well. 
folding displays, curved displays meant to kind of make your your in-flight experience feel a little bit more open and airy, which should be pretty interesting to see too, I think. Uh, but beyond that, we'll see smart home integration. So you'll be able to talk to your car, much like you can talk to your toilet seat or your shower head. Uh, and a lot of sensor updates too for autonomy. Um, so, you know, more of the p bits and pieces that we need to make our cars be able to drive themselves more safely sometime down the future. Now, th that sounds like the practical stuff we'll be seeing is is the yeah. sensors and, and the, the car has been sort of this parallel almost accessory in a way to the smart home. So I'm sure we're going to we're going to see some real things that you'll be able to buy that that are aftermarket improve your car. Maybe some of them will even be built into those concept cars. But will any of these cars fly? Maybe. Oh, Hyundai is promising that they'll show us what they're calling a personal air vehicle, uh, which will be their vision for a future of flying cars. Interestingly, they're also planning on having like a, a hub within every city that these cars will kind of launch from or connect to. Um, so it's basically going to be something like Uber Elevate, what they've shown us in the past. Basically, the idea will be an app or a transportation service. You won't be buying these flying cars, but you'll be able to summon a flying car and land near where you are, take you to where you're going to go. They showed a quick concept video of people flying in, you know, luxury and looking down at the the poor peons who are stuck in traffic below them. You know, the, the idyllic future for people in a flying car. Uh, but what exactly they're going to have being functional at the show that I don't know. Uh, last year, Honda actually showed a walking car, which is pretty neat. Um, but the only functional uh, demo was a, a little model that was about this big. Um, so I don't know if we'll see an actual flying car or not, but uh, it's it's fun to think about what the future might hold. So uh, when you say it'll land, it would like it would land in the street in front of you or it land at a nearby launch pad? That remains to be seen. I think it would have to be at, at a launch pad. Of course, yeah. the big question of all these flying cars is exactly what kind of legislation needs to be put in place to make sure. it happen. You, you know, we're seeing a lot of issues. Elon Musk wants to build tunnels and most cities are saying, no, you're not going to build a tunnel. Um, but what about flying a car over a city or landing on a rooftop? You need a lot of changes to make that uh, legal. And of course, a lot of proofs need to go into place to make them safe. Right. Uh, none of that infrastructure exists right now. Um, so it it is, you know, the tech technology question is getting closer to being answered, uh, but the legalities and the logistical questions are still, still, um, still pending. So the Hyundai flying car will be on your local news uh, for sure. Absolutely, uh, yeah. That, that's gonna that. that's gonna capture all of the all of the CES coverage. Uh, what about the Segway S Pod uh, that that sort of took over the headlines this morning? Because it's not a stand up Segway; it's a sit down Segway. Right. This is a new vision. You know, Segway gets a lot of buzz for whatever they do, and this is an interesting thing. The S Pod, you can think of it kind of like if you saw Wally, you know, the floating things that people were uh, floating along on, drinking their their slushies in. It's much like that, but it's on wheels. Uh, it does balance on two wheels, but it does have a third wheel that deploys uh, for maximum speed of 24 miles an hour, which is pretty quick. So we're thinking it'll probably hunker down on three wheels when you're going top speed. Uh, but if you're cruising through the mall, maybe, or, or a shopping center at a slower speed, it'll probably go up on two wheels and balance. Uh, what exactly, you know, the, the deployment is going to look like there, what the plans are, and of course, what it's going to cost. That remains to be seen. We'll have to wait until we get to Vegas next week. But it's an interesting idea, you know, for people either with limited mobility or maybe people who need to go a bit of a longer distance, maybe from one airport terminal to another. Uh, that sounds pretty nice to me. Yeah, I, I mean, having been to theme parks, seeing more people in these mobility scooters, I could see it being used for for things like that. Uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's meant to replace wheelchairs in general, but I don't see why it couldn't. Yeah, it definitely remains to be seen. You know, we, there are some really interesting wheelchair concepts out there that balance on two wheels that allow people to lift themselves up to access things on shelves and things like that. This looks like a bit of an evolution of that, something a little bit more accessible, meant for a more general purpose. But yeah, absolutely. I think this definitely could serve as a wheelchair for a lot of people. And the Segway is also going to have other things there, including uh, a boring old scooter that balances itself. It's <laughs> yawn compared to all this other stuff. Uh, that that's the T15 e-scooter. Is there anything particularly interesting about that? It's a little bit uh, more compact than before. I think, you know, this is pretty similar to some existing models that they have out there. You know, they moved away from the the larger segways a lot of us are familiar with to more uh, simple, smaller units that you can just step on basically and just control with your legs and your feet basically. So it's an evolution of that, but something that we've seen pretty much before. Now, uh, you mentioned that the Detroit Auto Show has moved to the summer. Uh, so there's, there's more of an opportunity for the automakers to focus on C CES for this time of the year, but I was surprised when you told me that GE is not going to be at CES this year. Uh, GM, yeah, General Motors. I'm sorry, it, GM. Yeah, GE it, will be there for sure. GM. <laughs> uh, GM CEO Mary Barrow was actually going to be a keynote speaker at CES this year, and, and GM's had a, a large presence at CES for a long time now. They actually unveiled the Chevrolet Bolt at CES back in 2016, and again, that was one of the uh, 
One of the moments where we realized that CES was really becoming a bit of a threat for Detroit because they unveiled the Bolt the week ahead of Detroit in, in Las Vegas. Um, but this year they actually pulled out and just uh, just about a month ago is when they did pull out. So very late uh, notice, uh, kind of scrapping all their plans and pulling out. Yeah, there was a lot of debate about it being related to the UAW strike that was ongoing uh, and that causing uh, delays to their their plans that they couldn't recover from. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit more complicated than, than just a simple strike related issue. But ultimately it was a pretty last minute pull out and they were expected to show off uh, what's going to be Cadillac's first electric car. Um, so we're going to have to wait a little bit longer to see that, I think. And that's a bit unfortunate that that won't be there. But, uh, yeah, definitely big news to have them pull out last minute. At least a, a pretty big hole. And they need to find some new uh, keynote speakers. And I think that may be why uh, Ivanka Trump uh, stepped in kind of last minute uh, as well. There was an opening for them to fill. So they, mm -hmm. they filled it. Interesting. Uh, I, I've also seen some stories around about uh, using some AI for a three-video feed rearview mirror from Aston Martin, uh, all digital cabin from Fiat Chrysler, uh, mm -hmm. AI stuff in Honda, uh, a lot of EV stuff, in, including Jeep possibly doing plug-in hybrids. Uh, we would expect to see autonomous tech, EV innovations. Is there any of those areas that, that you think we should pay close attention to? I definitely think that the mirror that Aston Martin is going to be showing off is interesting. We've seen digital mirrors before. In fact, General Motors was one of the first to show it off, I think, at CES, as a matter of fact, where basically you could flip uh, the the lever on the bottom of the mirror and it would turn it into a digital uh, LCD display showing a camera display instead of relying on a mirror. That's really great when you're talking about towing something. For example, if you have a big truck with a, a large horse trailer behind you, you can't see anything in the mirror. Now you can actually see through the trailer. Stuff like that is pretty neat. But the Aston Martin application takes it a step further by including the left and right views as well, meaning you can check your blind spot very quickly and easily, uh, especially if, if you have a sore neck, uh, which can be pretty nice. So um, that kind of technology, it's a minor step forward, but ultimately I think something that makes it a little bit safer, especially if you're talking about a sports car like an Aston Martin, that don't tend to have very good uh, rearward visibility anyway. Uh, little things like that, I think, will, will start to make our lives easier. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to see a lot more components uh, that will be themselves not that interesting, you know, LiDAR scanners with, with high resolution or that are smaller or that are cheaper. Um, but those are really important components as we're talking about getting our cars better able to see the world around them and leading to the autonomy that we all want to see. Yeah, there will be quite a few autonomous cars at CES as ever, uh, but ultimately nothing closer to, to, to something that you and I could buy. Gotcha. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit going into 2020. You can submit stories that you hope catch our eye and also vote on others. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. Bookmark it. Bookmark it now. Also join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com slash DTNS. What is in our New Year's mailbag? Oh, glad you asked, Tom. Sam wrote in and said... Quick comment about smart fridges after y'all talked about the new LG one that was in yesterday's show. Sam says, I really do wonder how big the potential market is in Europe. As far as I know, most kitchens in Europe have fridges built into cabinets, meaning that they kind of are flush with the rest of the cabinetry. So external screens don't make any sense. Here in Belgium, at least, almost nobody is interested in fridges that aren't built in. Well, I mean, you could have Depends a on your kitchen still in the cabinet, but the, but it won't fit with the rest of your decor at that point. Do you really want that? I mean, s some people have the uh, the see through cabinets where you can see the glassware in there, so maybe mm -hmm. it would fit with that design. That's a really good point, Sam. Thanks for bringing that perspective because uh, the, these big, huge American stand up fridges that we're always see seeing uh, don't fit in everywhere across the globe. And you know, Sam. Sam's right. I've, I've def I definitely know what he's talking about, and I do think it's more prevalent in Europe. It's also becoming more prevalent in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. At least in some, you know, some fancier kitchens. If you have the money to buy a smart fridge, it might not work with the rest of your, you know, fancy cabinetry. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Brad Schick, Paul Boyer, and Dustin Campbell. Let's check in with Len Peralta for the first tech art of 2020. Len, what have you drawn for us? Well, as is always the case with the first show of 20 of uh, the new year, it's always about CSS. And I want to say that the future is now at CS2 at 2020. Just looking over the notes, it's flying cars, smarter homes, balancing chairs. And this is what I think it's going to look like. Uh, it's CS <laughs> next week with Sarah and Tom sort of doing the flying car, the Hyundai flying car thing. And Tom might become a redhead. I, yeah, and George Jetson has a beard, too. Uh, he does a little bit, yeah. It's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, it's worth going, uh, making the trip 
out uh, to see us to see this happen. So, uh, yeah, the future is now. Uh, this is 2020. It is I just the noticed future. the Hyundai logo on the yep. flying <laughs> jet Yeah, this that. is what it's going to look like. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Just mark my words. I know this. This is what it's going to look like. Uh, this image is actually available right now in my online store, lenperaltstore.com. And uh, I am also on Patreon. You can, If you're a Patreon backer, if you back me at the $5 level, you can get every single one of these drawings I do uh, during the new year, even some some past ones. Uh, uh, so uh, go over there, patreon.com forward slash Len. Thanks to Tim Stevens for being with us, Tim. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a tradition at this point. Um, and I know you're going to be at CES. Uh, where can people keep up with all the work you'll be doing there next week? Yeah, uh, check out all the automotive content at uh, theroadshow.com. We'll have a lot of folks on the ground at CES, and I'll be there myself. And I'm on Twitter at uh, Tim underscore Stevens. Uh, if you haven't noticed, CES is coming next week. <laughs> uh, and we will be doing coverage right here on Daily Tech News Show from Las Vegas. We'll be in the Central Hall if you want to swing by and and say hello. Expect us to be talking about 8K TVs in all shapes and sizes, from OLED to micro LED. Samsung actually shipped the wall this past year. It was pretty crazy. Uh, there'll be some foldable mobile devices, smarter smart home stuff, Google and Amazon assistants and everything, 5G everything. Uh, Find out what the surprises are, though, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. You'll get some exclusive looks from CES from all of us. And, of course, every show, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, will be devoted to covering it as well. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We will be live from CES next week, as Tom mentioned, but it will be at our regular times, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Talk to you Monday from CES 2020. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>